Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. This morning is from the Stern School of Business, New York University, and given by Panos. Uh, okay, so the work that I'm going uh, to talk uh, today is part of uh, a bigger project uh, that uh, we have at NYU at Stern School of Business, uh, which is how we can uh, measure the value of information uh, that uh, exists online. And uh, we are doing that using some uh, interdisciplinary approach combining techniques uh, that uh, have been used extensively in econometrics with some uh, text mining te techniques. So, in particular, I'm going to talk today about uh, one of uh, the projects that uh, we have done and I will describe how we use econometrics uh, to do opinion mining and uh, we'll present a case study on reputation systems. At the end, I'm going to discuss very briefly other related uh, projects that we'll build on these uh, ideas. So since I'm going to talk about uh, reputation systems, uh, let me give you a brief context in uh, which uh, these reputation systems are being used. So suppose that you want to buy a product, let's say a digital camera. So one of the very common ways that people buy products is they go to a comparison shopper, they type the name of the product, let's say Canon, you know, EOS uh, 350D, they get back a list of merchants that uh, sell this particular product for different prices. Now, one of the very interesting characteristics and one of the very interesting phenomena that happens in online is that uh, people don't buy the product that has the lowest price. So if you observe, you know, when people have such lists available, which product they buy, very typically they buy from a merchant that has higher price than the lowest. In this case, buydig.com compared to PC Rush and PC Nation, which have lower prices which actually means that buydig.com has the ability to charge price premium, a higher price than the other merchant, for exactly the same product and still make the sale. So, and someone might ask, how often does this thing happen? And we have actually observed many transactions on uh, Amazon, and we observed that this is the distribution of price premiums that uh, merchants can get. So here is the price premium, the x-axis, and here is the number of transactions for which a merchant must get a positive price premium or they had to put lower price than other merchants in order to make the price. Everything that is negative is very rational. It means that you are paying lower price compared to another merchant. Everything that is positive means that you have the opportunity to buy something for lower price, but still you choose to pay a higher price to buy the product. So what does this mean? Does this mean that people are irrational? Well, not really. What happens is that people, when they buy things online, they don't pay just for the product. They only pay in order to buy reputation, in order to buy some peace of mind that the transaction is going to go smoothly. So they pay for transaction characteristics, like how fast I'm going to get the product. How reliable is the merchant? Is he polite? Does he send the packet the product in good packaging? So on. So, which means that customers care about the reputation of sellers and they are willing to pay to get this reputation. How do people assess the reputation of sellers? Well, typically each merchant, for example, in this case, the merchant Viat, they have a reputation profile in online markets where they have the average rating that they got from their customers over the last uh, say 12 months, over the last 30 days, how many positive comments they got, how many negative, and they also have a very large number of textual feedback where people decide to express with their sale. Something like very fast shipping, perfect packaging, no complaints or I have been waiting three weeks for an in-stock item. This is the worst internet experience that I ever had. So people use text to 
star rating to the seller, but also give, use the text to describe this experience. And of course, we have typically very large number of such feedback postings uh, for online art. Now, if we want to summarize this paper in a single slide, our conjecture is the following. The price premiums that merchants can charge is actually a measure of the reputation. A reputation is being cut in the text feedback the reputation provides. So in our contribution, what we are doing is we examine how the text affects the price premiums. It tends as we will see, we are doing some sentiment analysis as the side effect, measuring the economic value of the text that appears in the text feedback. But let me go to the thing, and the rest of the talk is structured as follows. First, we describe how we capture this price premium. So if we are not, how can we get this information? Then we'll describe how we catch the, uh, the text feedback, and then how we connect uh, the two in order to do the opinion mining. So what we have used is uh, we used a panel of 280 uh, software products, uh, and we observed these products over a period of uh, uh, six months. And uh, we used the used goods market of Amazon, where other merchants, except for Amazon, they are selling uh, uh, the same product. And we, as you will see, we didn't use any proprietary Amazon data. We just used Amazon Web Services to observe the marketplace and gather everything that uh, we needed. So what we are doing conceptually is we go to one of the, of the products that we monitor. So for example, Microsoft Office Professional. Then we have here a link that leads us to the secondary market where there are multiple merchants that sell exactly this product for different prices. So for example, Microsoft Office is uh, being sold for uh, $363 from uh, VR, uh, $364.75 by, by PCSoft, uh, $364 by Branton or Cool, and so on. So what we are doing in order to capture the price premiums, we repeatedly crawl the marketplace and we observe who is selling a product and which, for which price. As long as the product appears, there is no sale. Everything. However, at some point, we'll see that one of the items that is being offered disappears. It doesn't appear in the listings anymore. So in this case, we say, oh, OK. So in this case, buy PC soft, sold Microsoft Office, sold a copy of Microsoft Office for $364. Uh, dollars. And at the same time, we observe that the prices of the competitors are, you know, as given in the website. So in this case, we stop and we say, okay, we capture the sale. So now we compute for this sale the price premium that the merchant got for the transaction, which we define as the seller price minus the competitor price. And uh, if we really want uh, to be exhaustive, there are multiple other definitions of the price premiums, like uh, instead of measuring multiple seller competitor pairs, we can have just one average price premium, or we can compute the percentage and not the absolute price. But now for simplicity for this talk, we'll just focus on the regular price premiums. So now we have the price premiums. We set the price premiums measure a reputation which is being expressed in the text feedback. Previous studies of uh, online reputation assume that uh, reputation is a single metric. It is something like the average star rating that the merchant has or, you know, average uh, experience. What we say is that, well, reputation is not monolithic. People have reputation in different dimensions. They have reputation for good packaging. They have reputation for good delivery, for responsiveness, and uh, so on. And... Uh, so in order to find which are these uh, reputation characteristics, we scan all the feedback postings that uh, appear on Amazon, and we capture as dimensions the noun, the noun phrases, the verb and verbal phrases that appear in the feedback. So for example, packaging, delivery, arrived, shipped, all these describe uh, important dimensions of uh, reputation. So we scan the feedback, we find the most frequent one, and these are the important dimensions of reputation. Now, 
okay, we found which are important. However, we don't know what is the reputation that people have in these dimensions. People don't say delivery five out of five, packaging three out of five. You know? Instead, what they say is, well, you know, fast shipping, great packaging, you know, awesome and responsiveness, you know, unbelievable delays or unbelievable price. Now, the big problem is how do we find the meaning of these adjectives? Yes, we know what people say, but we don't know what these things mean. So in order to do that, we find in the feedback the phrases that we have, the important dimensions of reputation and the corresponding adjectives or adverbs. So for example, I was impressed by the speedy delivery, great service. We capture the phrase speedy delivery, and speedy describes the experience with delivery, great describes the experience with service. Same thing for the second posting, awful describes packaging, speedy describes delivery. And what we say is implicitly, each of these adjectives assigns a score to this dimension. So, for example, speedy, when it describes delivery, implicitly assigns a score to this dimension. We don't know the score. But now we can say, okay, if we try to compute now what's the text reputation uh, score, we say that the text reputation is a weighted sum of all these evaluations. So if someone had the speed delivery great service, the sum of the reputation is something like we have two times in the feedback the phrase speed delivery multiplied by the implicit weight of the delivery dimension plus great service plus awful packaging. Okay, nice modeling. Oops. What's the problem now? We have no idea what these numbers are and we have no idea what is this thing that we are trying to measure. However, if we now connect the price premiums with the text feedback, we have something like, we have now the price premium, the reputation premium, which is the PI, which is the price premium. Plus, we have the score as expressed in the text. So we know now the price premiums, and we know how frequently these phrases appear. So essentially now this becomes almost like a regression, simple regression problem that we say, uh, and we run now price premiums as the independent variable. These are the dependent variables, and we try to find what is the best coefficient that should go in front of each of these dimensions. So I will not go into other details, but after we run the regression, we get results like someone who has fast delivery, everything else being equal, compared to someone that has slow delivery, can charge $10 more. Which means now that fast is $10 better than slow when it evaluates the dimension delivery. And here are some of the results that uh, we got, which says, for example, wonderful experience is a positive evaluation that has a value of $5.86. Outstanding seller has a positive effect on the reputation and has value $5.76. No. If we go to the negative, we have never received, decreases the ability of someone to get higher price premiums and has negative, uh, you know, minus $7. Horrible experience, never sent, never received. Actually, you will see now that by doing this regression, you have a very natural way of extracting the sentiment strength and the polarity. Yeah. And interestingly enough, you will see that this is actually even better than using simple linguistic approach. For example, it captures very easily misspellings. So we had excellent service or horrible experience or never received. Actually, that was one of the most frequent evaluations. So these are misspellings. But because this technique is agnostic to the, you know, to the linguistic meaning of these words, it actually captures these things very naturally. Other thing that we uh, this good is suppose we have the evaluation good packaging. Is it a positive or a negative evaluation? We don't have the clicker now. Right. So how many people believe that it's positive? Negative? Well, what happens is good packaging actually within this context 
has a negative effect. And why this happens? People in all marketplaces say, hey, 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 seller, you know, excellent uh, delivery, outstanding packaging. So a mere good packaging is actually perceived as lukewarm. It sounds like getting a recommendation letter that says, uh, yeah, he's a good student, has good handwriting. So, so actually you can see that once you put the economic interpretation of uh, this opinion mining, you start capturing nicely the pragmatics of the language that is being used within the settings. And you can capture things that traditional techniques wouldn't be able to capture. So some further evidence that we have used to test uh, the importance of this approach, we try to predict what will happen in the future if we use these uh, text evaluations. So what we did is uh, we trained the system on past transactions, trying to find uh, who is going to make the sale, given two merchants that are selling the same product, which of the two is going to make the sale. And we built a decision tree for interpretability, and when we added only the uh, price of the product, we have observed that our predictive accuracy is very, very low. It's only 55%, which means that people rarely look at the price. When we add numeric reputation, like the average number of stars, average experience, and so on, we increase, we go to 74%. But when we add the text as features, we actually can reach almost 90% predictive accuracy of who is going to make uh, uh, the sale, which actually means that the text carries more information than the simple numeric metrics. And uh, taking now this idea and extending it to multiple different contexts, uh, we can have very interesting uh, applications. So, for example, we can analyze product reviews and product sales. This has been, thought, this has been discussed uh, earlier today. In this case, what we have is a paper that will be presented in KDD this year. We have much longer text. So in reputation feedback, we had only one line of text. With product reviews, we might have paragraphs. Plus, we have very few reviews, much fewer reviews uh, compared to the reputation. In reputation, we had hundreds and hundreds of feedback postings. With reviews, it's good if you have tens of reviews per product. So we run into big data sparseness problems, and uh, we have introduced the technique of uh, decomposing you know, uh, the problem into a lower dimension uh, approximation of uh, this uh, evaluation space and uh, uh, discovering uh, what happens. Uh, sentiment affects uh, you know, the usefulness of uh, reviews how this, the financial news actually doesn't affect the stock price, but uh, affects the future variance of uh, the price. So we are trying to see how financial news affect the stock option prices. With stock price, it's actually extremely difficult, and has been discussed before, it only has explanatory value, not predictive value. And uh, we can also analyze political news and uh, book in uh, people perceive Hillary. Clinton and combine it with, actually, with election posts or even better with prediction marks to find what the chart uh, in online blocks and uh, in online news the best probability that Hillary Clinton will win or you know some of the elections. Uh, okay. so I'll get the idea. So we have uh, data uh, and uh, the source code on our website at Economics and NYU. And uh, actually, let me give some description of the data. Unfortunately, we've seen that the data set was actually a little bit of limited value for us. What we really wanted was a uh, large number of product searches. So, in order to decompose, to, to isolate the effect of a single review, we need a large number of product searches to find out what is the popularity of the product, how often people search for that uh, particular product. So we didn't have that many product searches in the query log. Perhaps if we get queries from MSN Shopping, these queries would have been much more valuable for our project. We definitely need longer time period for the studies that we are doing. One month is very good to start over six and ten months of one month. We had the zip code, so 
for some geographic location of the queries so that we can see some things that are sensitive to graphic phenomena, analyze the directions of location and uh, product search, you know, people in the search for different products uh, compared to people in the, in the course and uh, stuff like that. And uh, that's it, so welcome questions. Mm -hmm. um, really interesting work. I had a couple of questions. Uh, both are quite short. Sure. Can you back up to where you had the results? Yeah, so, so um, forward a slide, actually. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't quite understand. You're saying that. Uh, you got an accuracy of 87% with text only, not including price. Not including price, not including uh, numeric reputation as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, did you do statistical significance on these on these numbers? Yes. How, and I am very strong. We have very big data sets. And okay. Um, actually, everything is statistically significant at the 0.1% level that we present here. Um, so, uh, really, really fascinating. I look forward to taking a look at the KDD paper. I guess I had one, one when you started the talk, I was wonder, worried a little bit about the methodology. I mean, the results suggest that this isn't a problem, but um, presumably when somebody's listing a product on Amazon, they typically are listing at various other places too, possibly eBay, many other marketplaces. So when somebody takes it off Amazon, it could be because they sold it. It also could be they sold it on some other marketplace where they might be offering it for a different price simply because uh, the overhead at, at different marketplaces is different. Any, any thoughts on that? Okay, I will give a short answer and I will delegate to the expert, you know, the economist, you know, who is, can answer these things better. Uh, first of all, people can list the same product multiple times on Amazon in different price levels and people do that very often so they can hedge, you know, their, their chances. So I oversimplified a little bit in what they presented. So about uh, the eBay I think. What, what we do observe is, uh, for instance, if some seller is delisting and listing back at a different price, we can track that because every seller has a unique ID as well as every listing has a unique ID. But if it's outside of Amazon, then we have no idea. Um, so on the same thread, mm -hmm. presumably someone who lists something like that on Amazon might have a warehouse of a thousand of them and they're just trickling them through at the same price and you'll never know exactly how many sales. So in a sense you're picking up on the last sale no. of an item. Of the other. Good point. Uh, I, I oversimplified the slides here. So what we're doing is we have web services to track that and there each of the products that is being listed, if you list Microsoft Office, and you have 1,000 copies of that, each of them will get a different listing ID. You will have the same product ID, but each of the 1,000 products that you list on Amazon will have a separate listing ID, and only one of them if they have the same price here. So, so, so it's not possible for Buy PC Soft to list an item and then have a hundred of them sitting in the Buy PC yeah. Soft yeah. warehouse and they just keep the listing there as if it never got sold, but they keep on selling them. Oh, no, 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 because uh, once they have the listing, if someone buys it, it will disappear. If they, have, if they follow this approach that you are suggesting, you know, I put one listing and I'm trying to sell them all by having one listing, once someone buys the first copy, the listing will disappear, so they will have to, to relist it. But okay. I can say I have 1,000 copies, they appear here, and each one of them internally in Amazon Web Services, you can see that each one of them has a different listing ID. Yep, okay. Uh -huh. um, so the other question I was going to ask was about your, your listing of dollar amounts for comments. Mm -hmm. um, so this, these, these are coefficients in your, in your weighting formula. Exactly. Does this mean that someone can, um, that the company might find it worthwhile to sit there and having people spam the comments so that uh, every time someone types very, very fantastic, fantastic packaging, they can put the price up by $5? Yeah, that's a, well, you know, first of all. Is, is this per comment, these, these numbers? $5? You, you reach, uh, sorry? You, is, is if, if a single comment says wonderful experience, does that represent $5.86 or is this a 
it's normalized. some kind of a weighted normalized it's thing. Normalized. Everyone said wonderful experience. Exactly. So, okay. Everything is normalized. So, uh, in principle, what we are doing is we'll collapse all the comments in one single mega comment. Yep. So, this one would say, if everyone said wonderful experience in their comments, then they would have, compared to someone who has now experience, they would be able to, to have a premium of five, yep. six. So, yes, it's normalized. Second, uh, the question about uh, spamming. Uh, Amazon is a little, this is actually very, very common phenomenon on eBay. So people try to spam the reputation system by essentially selling a PDF file for 25 cents. So the only purpose of this transaction is that I can give you good feedback, you give me good feedback. For Amazon, in order to list something, you have to list a product that Amazon sells, which is typically high priced, which means that for each transaction that you complete, and you can only put a transaction feedback comment only when you complete a transaction, it means that you will have to pay quite significant amount of money in order to, to spam your own reputation. Okay. So on eBay, this is rampant. That actually, there are papers out that describe how this thing happens. On Amazon, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. We haven't observed it sure. that much. So. Uh, okay. Okay. Shouldn't these um, prices be, shouldn't the premium be greater for uh, products that are more expensive? And so shouldn't you be putting um, percentages to increase the price uh, or decrease it? Yeah, two, two things. One is this regression first includes the price as a control variable, one thing. Second, if you want to do this percentage, we have to use the relative price premium as the dependent variable. I don't have the results on the slides now, but we also run these regressions. So when, where the dependent variable is not the absolute dollar value, but the percent that's on the price. So we just have different definition of the price premium. The results are pretty similar. Thanks. Um, what about, uh, I assume you also controlled for or looked into the effects of um, uh, how many transactions the user had, had gone, uh, the seller had made before? Is that? Yes, yes. Um, any comments on the results there? Oh, yes, it's actually expected that uh, the higher the number of transactions, the larger the reputation premium that people can, can charge. And, uh, but we control, the results here actually have this variable as control variable, so it already absorbs its own effect. So. Uh, I guess I was wondering, I'm expecting that it's somehow nonlinear in the sense that once a person does right. some small number of transactions, so much more. Do you have a sense of what, what that number is? We haven't tried non-linear models. Uh, be, I can tell you why. Uh, because the linear models gives us the nice property that we can see these nice coefficients here. If we put something like an SVM or, you know, regression, I will have no idea how its feature contributes to the... Pen. Okay, we haven't tried it. Seriously. Okay, we haven't tried it. <laughs> Summarizes. I think we're going to continue the discussion over lunch. <laughs> well, was it a short one? Okay, come on. Are you up to it? Are you guys up to it? Okay. <laughs> Can I get you to sell the software to my dean for use on student evaluations? We have, thinking, <laughs> I have been thinking about that. I'd like so. some feedback into my salary. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you.